So the next segment is going to be about the pen tree bank, which is one of the most important resources in, uh, used in building parsers. Uh, one thing that I would like to mention here is that the pen tree bank paper, even though it doesn't describe any specific algorithm or evaluation, uh, is one of the most cited papers in the entire history of natural language processing. So what is the pen tree bank? Why is it important? So the Pentry Bank was created in the early 90s at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and uh, it was designed so that people can build uh, trainable parsers. So the idea was to take uh, human annotators and to ask them to parse sentences by hand and then use this information as uh, features for the development of parsers. So the paper uh, that is cited the most is by uh, uh, Mitch Marcus, Beatrice Santorini and Marianne Marcinkiewicz from 1993. Uh, the size of the pen tree bank is not that large. It has about 40,000 training sentences that have been processed by hand and 2,400 test sentences. So uh, just to give your heads up, if you train a parser on the pen tree bank, you should never look at the test data until your parser is fully developed. So the genre of text included in the pen tree bank is mostly Wall Street Journal news stories and also some uh, spoken conversations. So uh, to summarize its importance, uh, the Pantry Bank uh, single-handedly helped launch uh, modern automatic parsing methods. So here are some pointers if you want to explore the Pantry Bank. Uh, the, it's available from the LDC catalog uh, as uh, LDC 99 uh, number 42. There's an older version available from 95 as well. And uh, here is a website that gives you the tokenization guidelines, how to split sentences into words. Uh, and finally, there is another pointer of a similar resource called the American National Corpus, uh, which is also available online. So what does the Pentry Bank tag set look like? Uh, well, the next two slides are going to show you uh, the different tags for parts of speech. Uh, let's start with some examples. CC stands for coordinating conjunction, such as the word and. Uh, CD is a cardinal number, for example, one. Uh, determiner, like the, is marked as DT. Uh, adjectives are JJ. Modals are MD. Uh, singular or mass nouns are marked as NN. And then you can add an extra S or P at the end to indicate uh, plural. Uh, you can also have RB for adverb. Uh, verbs, the base form of a verb is VB, but you can also have uh, special cases. For example, VBD is the past tense of a verb, such as uh, took. VBG is a gerund or present participle. VBN is the past participle, for example, taken, and so on. And one important thing to realize is that all the prepositions are marked with uh, the special symbol IN. Th that symbol is not just used for the preposition in, it's used for any preposition or subordinating conjunction, except for the preposition to, which has its own tag, namely to. And the reason is that the preposition to is also used a lot in uh, uh, infinitives and uh, some other special constructions as to be significantly different from the rest of the prepositions. So here's an example sentence. Uh, it's from the Wall Street Journal section of the Pantry Bank. It's section 12, sentence 11. Uh, because the CD had an effective yield of 13.4% when it was issued in 1994 and interest rates in general had declined sharply since then, part of the price Dr. Blumenfeld paid was a premium, an additional amount on top of the CD's base value plus accrued interest that represented the CD's increased market value. I took the time to read the sentence in its entirety just to give you an appreciation of the complexity and the subject matter that is uh, specific to the Pantry Bank. So this is the uh, beginning of the sentence, represented exactly as it appears in the Pantry Bank. You can recognize some uh, non-traditional labels here. For example, S bar corresponds to the fragment of the sentence that starts with because. Uh, and you can have another S bar, uh, the one that corresponds to the time expression, when it was issued, and so on. And you have specific uh, uh, words, for example, the PP uh, at the bottom of the screen in 1984 is labeled as a PP uh, time. TMP stands for temporal prepositional phrase that expresses uh, time. 
Uh, this thing here is in a relatively small font, but I had to fit it all in one screen. Uh, this is the full parse tree that corresponds to the specific site. As you can see that it's very complicated. And the way to read it is uh, in three columns, left to right. So here are some other interesting uh, factors here. For example, the coordinating conjunction end is indicated with CC, and you can have uh, two sentences conjoined with this end. So the first one is the one that starts with the CD had an effective yield of 13.4% and so on. And the second one is interest rates in general had declined sharply. Uh, so this grammar allows for coordinating uh, conjunctions to link sen entire sentences. So let's look at some of the peculiarities of the Pen3 Bank. It includes things like complementizers, for example, the word that. It includes gaps, for example, uh, the word none. For example, if you have a sentence that says, uh, Mary likes uh, chemistry and hates biology, uh, the subject of the second verb hates is also Mary, and it appears as a gap in the parse tree, so it will be labeled with the string star non star. And it also includes a special category called S-bar, which comes from uh, uh, X-bar theory. Uh, it's, uh, in this example, a sentence that starts with a complementizer. For example, I don't believe that he will come tomorrow. So that he will come tomorrow is an S-bar. So there is a tool that you can use to parse the Pentry Bank that allows you to search for specific uh, configurations of uh, non-terminals and terminals. And here are some of the uh, operators. A less than B uh, gives you sentences where uh, A as a non-terminal immediately dominates or is the parent of B. A less than less than B means that A is somewhere above B in the parse tree, but it's not necessarily its parent and so on. As you can see, the syntax uh, here is pretty rich and that gives you a good opportunity to find uh, sentences to use as examples. So this is more or less what the Pentry Bank looks like. What is it used for? Well, first of all, it has some disadvantages. Uh, the general idea of using three banks seems like a non-starter, if you ask me, uh, because it takes a lot more work to annotate uh, 40,000 sentences than to write a grammar. But this may be only a superficial disadvantage. Uh, there are actually some advantages as well. Uh, you can use uh, the Pen3 Bank to count statistics about different constituents and phenomena. For example, how many times does a noun phrase turn into a specific right-hand side in, uh, when it's part of the subject of the sentence or when it's part of the object of the sentence. You can use it to train systems and you can use it to evaluate systems. So you can have an automatic parser uh, produce its output and then you can compare that output using some well-defined statistical techniques uh, against the manual annotations. It's also possible to use the same technology for uh, building a multilingual versions of the Pen3 Bank. In fact, many such versions exist for many European languages as well as Chinese and Korean and so on. So now let's see how we can use something like the Pen3 Bank for evaluating parsers. So the evaluation methodology in general is the same as the one that is used for evaluating classifiers. You have, for example, a binary classifier where uh, every object in your data set has to be labeled as either true or false or either positive or negative. So, so what are some traditional classification tasks? A document retrieval is one example. Uh, you have a document, you have a query, and you have to say whether this document is relevant to the query, yes or no. Part of speech tagging is a classification task where you have more than two classes. So for example, a word like round can be labeled as a noun or a verb or as an adjective out of the sequence of parts of speech that I showed you earlier, which has about 60 different parts of speech. Parsing can also be considered as a classification task. You have essentially a, a set of words that can be labeled as either a sentence or a noun phrase or a verb phrase. And if you get the class right, you should get some points. If you get it wrong, you should lose some points. So the Pentry Bank is split uh, in general into a training set and a test set. In more general cases uh, for classification evaluation, you have three sets, a training set that is used to learn what the data looks like. Then a dev test set, which is used to test your uh, parsing method without touching the official test set. So if you use a dev test set, you can go back and retrain your system and see 
how well it works uh, without uh, going to the official test set. And finally, you have the official test set, which you're only allowed to look at once after your parser has been developed. If you look at it more than once, you would essentially overfit and your results are not going to be valid and they're not going to be acceptable by the research community. So what are some of the baselines used in evaluation? You can have a dumb baseline, for example, label everything as a noun or label everything as a noun phrase. Uh, you can also have an intelligent baseline, which typically is um, something straightforward. For example, label every word with its most likely part of speech looking at the training data. So for example, if the word round can be either a noun, a verb, or an adjective, but the, the noun sense of round is the most frequent one, you can label it as round as a noun every time, and uh, that will give you a more intelligent baseline than the one that just says every, label every word as a noun. You can also have a human performance metric that tells you how accurate the system can be expected to be. If humans don't agree on their performance, uh, that means that the system should not be expected to do any better than the human. So for example, if on the part of speech tagging task, humans only achieve 98% accuracy, you should not expect your part of speech system to go above 98%. So if you define a new method, for example, let's say some statistical parser, you have to be able to compare it against those baselines and the human performance using some standard set of evaluation methods. So what people typically use are accuracy. So how many times does the label that you predict uh, match the correct label? Precision and recall, which we have looked at in an earlier uh, set of slides, which tell us uh, for precision, uh, of all the things that you have labeled as positive, uh, how many are actually positive according to the training data. And recall is when you measure of all the things that you could have labeled as positive based on the training data, how many you actually labeled as positive. And there are extensions to accuracy, precision, and recall that take into account the fact that there may be multiple references that conflict with one another. For example, different humans disagreeing on some specific uh, label. So in that case, you have to take into account the interjudge agreement. The interjudge agreement just tells you what percentage of times the human judges pick the same label. And finally, you can use a metric called kappa which looks like this. So kappa is a normalized uh, performance of your system. Uh, P of A is the agreement between uh, your system and the human judges or between multiple human judges. And P of E is the expected agreement if the judges were to label some things randomly. So for example, uh, if a kappa is greater than 0.7, it is assumed that interjudge agreement is high. If it's somewhere much lower than that, for example, 0.4 or 0.3, that means that the task is not well defined and you should probably not consider it at all uh, because no matter what results your system achieves, it will not be uh, meaningful if the judges themselves don't agree on the correct labels. So this is more or less how evaluation is done in general. So I have a question for you. If Judge agreement on a binary classification task is 60%. Is this high enough? Is it good? What do you think? Well, the answer to the question is, if we consider uh, the formula for kappa, and we plug in the numbers, we have the probability of uh, A, uh, which is the agreement, is 0.6. But the expected agreement by chance, given two classes, is 0.5. So if we compute kappa, we we'll realize that the value of kappa is 0.1 in the numerator divided by 0.5 in the denominator, which is equal to 0.2 or 20%. And as we said on the previous slide, 20% is not, by far not, an acceptable uh, interjudge agreement. So in this case, we can say that the task is not well defined. So how do we evaluate parsers? Well, there are some standard techniques for evaluating them. There are, some of them are based on precision and recall, whether you get the constituents right or not. You can also have labeled precision and recall. So in the difference between precision and recall and labeled precision and recall is that in the former case, you're only looking at whether you get the right words bracketed together properly. But in labeled precision and recall, you also want to make sure that the label of each non-terminal is correct. So for example, if you label something as a verb phrase where it's actually a noun phrase, 
you're not going to get full credit on labeled precision and recall, even though you would get full credit on precision and recall. Uh, one metric that is used uh, a lot to combine precision and recall is F1. F1 is just the harmonic mean of precision and recall, and it's highest when both precision and recall are high. It's low when one of them is high and the other one is low and vice versa. So one specific uh, twist in evaluating parsers has to do with something called crossing brackets. So if the correct parse is A, B, C, where B and C are grouped together before they join A, and your system produces A, B grouped together before joining them with C, you're going to get a crossing bracket error. So in the Petri Bank corpus, uh, as I mentioned before, people usually train on sections 02 to 21. They use section 22 for development, like dev test, and they finally evaluate their performance on section 23. So let's look at an example of an evaluation. This is the gold standard for the sentence that Japanese industrial companies should know better. And this is the output of a relatively state-of-the-art parser, the Charniak parser. Uh, it produces the parse shown at the bottom here. And you can see that there are some differences. They are shown in boldface. For example, it has used a different part of speech for the word better. Instead of labeling it as JJR, it labeled it as an RBR. So this is going to reduce its labeled accuracy and its labeled precision and recall and labeled F1. So overall, the output of the parse evaluation for this pair of sentences is that the bracketing recall is 80% because uh, 8 out of 10 are correctly picked. The bracketing precision is 2 thirds, 6 out of 9. Uh, what that means is that 3 of the ones that were picked by the Charnier parser are incorrect. The F measure, which is the uh, harmonic mean of those two numbers, is 72%. Complete match uh, is 0, meaning that the sentence was not completely parsed correctly. Uh, it gets a 100% uh, score on no crossing because there are no crossing dependencies. And finally, its uh, tagging accuracy is 87.5 or 7 out of 8 words were correctly labeled, the one mistake being the word better. So this is the kind of numbers that you would see reported in papers, uh, bracketing measures and tagging accuracy and complete match and non crossing. So this concludes the section on evaluating parsers. Uh, in uh, the next segment, we're going to talk about statistical parsing.